Humanity has only two years left to save the world. That's the message from the UN's climate chief. As more people worldwide deal with record-breaking temperatures and natural disasters, what more can be done to cut emissions and cool our heating planet? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Laura Kyle. We've got just two years left to make the dramatic changes needed to prevent irreparable damage to our planet. That's the warning from the UN climate chief, Simon Steele. The scientific challenges are immense, but Steele warns it's overcoming political challenges that will make or break the battle to reverse our current course of events. And he says rich countries need to step up to tackle this crisis. We'll explore all this further with our guests in just a moment after this report from Victoria Gatenby. Flood water has engulfed cities across southern Russia and parts of Kazakhstan after Europe's third longest river burst its banks. It's the latest dire weather-related event that scientists say may be linked to climate change. Snow started melting very rapidly because temperatures uh, were uh, rising very rapidly. And within uh, basically days, temperatures went from zero and, uh, to uh, 17, 18 or even 20 degrees. In every country, on every continent, the climate emergency is taking hold. In Chile, strong winds and high temperatures have been fueling severe wildfires in its central regions. On the other side of the world, in Zimbabwe, the government has declared a state of emergency because of extreme drought. The UN climate chief says the time for action is running out. When I say we have two years to save the world, it begs the question, who exactly has two years to save the world? The answer is every person on this planet. The UN says the world's 20 richest countries are responsible for 80% of global CO2 emissions. It warns greenhouse gas emissions must be cut by nearly half in just six years if global warming is to be limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And also says governments are not prioritizing climate action. Last month was officially the warmest on record. Average sea surface temperatures were also the hottest. Seeing records like this uh, month in, month out, really shows us that our climate is changing, is changing rapidly, and climate change isn't a future problem. It's, it's a problem that we have to face here and now. The UN says the window of opportunity to beat climate change is quickly closing, and extreme weather events will only get worse unless the world acts now to secure a livable future for all. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And in Brussels, Patrick Tenbrink, Secretary General of the European Environmental Bureau. In Dublin, John Sweeney, Professor Emeritus at Maynooth University and a contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And also in Brussels, Suzanne Lynch, Global Playbook author and Associate Editor at Politico. A very warm welcome to all of you. John, we have two years left to save the planet. Now, the UN climate chief has admitted that this sounds melodramatic, but do you agree with the sentiment? I do indeed. I mean, I think it's, he's merely echoing what the IPCC have been saying for many years, that uh, procrastination uh, and delay um, makes our task almost insurmountable the longer we delay. Um, I think, you know, he's only echoing as well what the EU themselves have said in their very recent uh, risk assessment. The, the European Environment Agency, um, a part of the EU, has said even more starkly that mm. if we don't uh, act now, then we do face catastrophic damage even within Europe in the years ahead. So I, I don't think he's being melodramatic. I think what he's saying is that we may be approaching tipping points, and those tipping points may not be recoverable from in many cases. Uh, and that's quite obvious if we're now approaching that 1.5 degree value of global warming. So, um, unfortunately, um, although he's saying we have two years to save the world, some of our politicians think that they have two months to mm. save their jobs. 
OK, all right, we will get, we will get into that in, in just a moment, both into the 1.5 degrees Celsius and the politicians' reactions. Patrick, first of all, could you just give us an idea of why he's chosen this period, two years, and what exactly needs to be done? Well, I mean, there's an, a massive urgency of actually engaging in this, and I think we're very, very close to the 1.5 degrees. And you've seen all the evidence of, of the impacts. I mean, the, there is a real window of opportunity now in, in Europe. We're actually coming to the end of this legislative cycle, so this parliament and this commission president. And at the moment, the heads of state are discussing as to what should be the strategic guidelines for the next five years. These will help guide the, the, the next commission president in deciding what she or he will wish to have as priorities, and that in turn will then decide as well what will be on the, on the table the next five years. So really, uh, and most of the impacts will be in the first sort of 100 days, the first year of the next commission. So that's why these two years are, are fundamentally important. Mm. You need to implement all the promises that you've already had now, and you need to actually ramp up some of the ambition and need to address the gaps. And only then do we have hope. Patrick, I know that you've seen a leaked draft of the EU's priority list for the next five years. It is in its draft stage, but just outline for us what is in it, or rather, what is not in it? Right. So they've, they've basically taken a, a leaf out of the old playbook from about five or ten years ago. It has, um, it has sort of three main threads, which is a strong and secure Europe, a prosperous and competitiveness Europe, a free and democratic Europe. And of course, all of these things are, are what we wish. But what's blatantly missing is any reference to the triple climate crisis, basically mm. the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, and the pollution crisis, and all that's linked. And also what's fundamentally missing is the idea of a just transition as well, the whole social dimension. So these two elements are, are missing, and uh, the evidence around us is that we can't move forward unless we have the whole of Europe with us. So we need a just transition, and we need to basically deal with these crises. They'll be bigger than the immediate political crisis that we have in Europe. Um, so. In, in some ways, what I would say is that we need two additional priorities to the three. One is a green transition Europe, and the other is a just transition Europe. And the green and just transition in some ways should be the overarching one for everything, because that would actually also then support the three other objectives, which are, of course, fine. Mm. Uh, Suzanne, it's interesting looking at this priority list of the, Europe, of the EU, isn't it? Because the previous one, the previous five years, it put climate change front and centre, calling it an existential threat. So what's changed? So back in 2019, when the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen was starting her first five-year term, um, this was before COVID. Uh, this was before the war in Ukraine, the full-fledged uh, invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And since then, Europe has been struggling with high energy prices as a result of that war in Ukraine, um, a rising inflation as well. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of voters are not putting uh, climate change as far up their um, level or their list of concerns ahead of these elections. Um, and Ursula von der Leyen, who's he who heads up the European Commission, has said as much. She is now running for a second term, a second five-year term. As we've been hearing there, we do have a leaked copy of the you know initial discussion about what the priorities are. But mm. she launched her campaign a couple of months ago. She, she didn't really mention climate either. Instead, the focus now in Europe is very much on defence, on trying to increase Europe's defence capacity, for example. It's on migration and it's on the economy. So I think other issues have moved centre stage, particularly here in Brussels, for those uh, in power at the moment, at least. So, Suzanne, what, what are the consequences of that? Just as we need to be pulling out all the stops to lowering temperatures, governments, at least in the EU, seem to be ignoring it. What's that going to cause? Well, in, in the immediate term, we are seeing now, and it's only, you know, we're in the last few months of this current administration, if you like, and we're already seeing problems in trying to implement some bits of the EU's Green Deal that people thought would get through. For example, there's been a huge row here in Brussels over something called the Nature Restoration Law, 
that was supposed to kind of restore um, damaged biodiversity areas across Europe. And we've seen lots of countries now come out, some of them quite last minute, saying they can't support them. Hungary, for example, which had kind of played along and seemed fine with this regulation, has now come in and said, no, we're in solidarity with farmers uh, and we don't think that this law should go through. So it's already having an impact on some of the specific, quite technical measures that the EU is pushing through. I mean, let's, a bit of perspective is that the EU has generally been a leader on climate mm. change. You know, it's ahead of other blocs, of, of certainly of the United States, of China, of other big countries. So I think it is a worrying sign that if the EU is not going to prioritise this, well then, who is? Absolutely, because, John, there was a recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to which you are a contributor, having every scenario showing that the world is likely to overshoot the goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise. Tell us about those scenarios. Well, those scenarios um, have been around for some time, but the, the recent report confirmed that uh, almost uh, it's going to be almost impossible now to avoid that 1.5 degree scenario. And the consequences of that are that we know certain things will happen which may not be recoverable. We know we're probably going to lose the coral reefs. We know we may have started already the irrevocable melting out of Greenland and parts of Antarctica. Uh, and that will go on in terms of rising sea level for centuries, uh, the, the, those last two things. We know also that we may be dicing with the Atlantic uh, uh, overturning circulation with all of the consequences uh, that has for Europe. And putting that all together, um, you know, it, it really amp amplifies what Suzanne was saying there, that sadly, instead of recognising the need for safety, we're seeing instead a dismantling of many of the um, more progressive Aggressive actions that the Commission took in the first few years of its um, of its tenure. We've seen the nature restoration law being blocked. We've seen the dismantling of uh, of green um, environmental measures and cap taking place. And that strategic agenda um, that we've also mentioned as well is pretty well a disaster in terms of putting climate change up as a priority for the incoming mm. Commission. So all of that is putting together a picture of a loss of leadership, a loss of heart. Uh, and for many member states, of course, that's really quite bad because we often depend on the Commission and the EU in general to put backbone into local politicians who right. respond to much more localised things. And that's, that's one of the saddest things we've seen in the past month of deregulation that has been going on. Patrick, one of the, the quotes that really struck me as I was researching for this topic was by a former NASA climate scientist, James Hansen. He said, 1.5 is deader than a doornail, and anybody who understands the physics knows that. So why then do we have our leaders ignoring the science? Well, I think a lot of it now is, well, partly they're not ignoring all the science because a lot of them actually really understand this and, and want to move forward. So we, we can't mm. just have a complete broad brush saying that no one's for it. There's a lot of good people trying to do good things. But the problem is that the people talk about policy making being the answer of the possible. And I think that the, the constellation is that there's a lot of people arguing for short-term interests and they're not willing to make the efforts now to be able to to make, make sure that, that we address the long-term and the medium-term impact, impact, in, impacts. And I think a lot of that is short-term politics because we're heading into the European elections. And so people are trying to win, win votes. Um, Ursula von der Leyen is part of the European People's Party, and she needs to show that she has their, uh, has their, uh, has their thoughts in mind, and so she gets their backing when she moves forward. Also, in the European Parliament, the, the, if you look at the way the, uh, the polls are going, it shows more and more for the far right, who are going to be very difficult. So you see a shift towards sort of more far right sensitive um, uh, positions. And so they're throwing a whole bunch of things under the bus to be able to show that they're actually meriting being, um, uh, being electable. Um, so that's a lot of reasons. And there's also an incredible amount of, of lobbying going on to basically have this deregulation to water down all of these of these laws. There's also a whole bunch of good industries who are trying to advance on things, just to be clear. Huh? Um, mm. But there is a schism uh, between those people who are really fighting hard to undermine everything and those that are actually trying to progress things. And, and I don't think the battle's been lost yet.
OK, yes, and let, let's just pick up on that, because there is a broad ambition for net zero by 2050 in the interest of not casting gloom and doom across the whole world. Is there any nation or group that's on track to achieve that? Yes, there are a number of nations that are really pushing for it across across the world. I mean, even the ones that you don't think are pushing for it, because people very, very easily say, oh, China is the greatest polluter. And of course, it's polluting a huge amount. But if you're looking at the scale of the investment to in, in renewable energies in China, it's absolutely gobsmacking the amount they're doing. So and even even in America, who we, we can often criticize as being way behind Europe, if you look at Texas, actually renewables is displacing fossil fuels in Texas, the home of uh, the whole of the home of fossil fuels. So I think there's there are really examples across the world of people doing quite a lot, whether it's governments or individuals or regions or cities. So I think there is hope, um, mm. but we just need to accelerate that faster. And we, what we really don't want to do is to undermine it by by basically changing the strategic agenda uh, towards one which is going back 10 years. I mean, we really okay. need to say very clearly we need to get this done. Because, Suzanne, however, <laughs> countries are supposed to have halved greenhouse or supposed to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And yet, last year, they increased to a record high. Can you explain that? Well, for example, in the EU, you've got 27 very different countries in the European Union. So, yes, there are targets. Each country has targets. But each country has very different economies and histories. So, for example, some countries, farming emissions will be a big part of their emissions issue. But other countries, it would be heavy industry, for example. And then you've got a whole debate within Europe about countries who are pro-nuclear energy, um, like France, for example, is very strong on this, and those who have abandoned or don't want to engage in nuclear energy, uh, like Germany, uh, who decided to move away from nuclear under Angela Merkel. So you've got all these competing priorities within the EU about who should bear the brunt of, as they see it, costs uh, to tackling climate change. And the sector that has been the most vocal, and there is a lot of lobbying going on here, but the sector that has been most vocal has undoubtedly been the farming community. Mm. Here in Brussels, we've a lot of protests by farmers. We've seen them right across Europe, uh, in Italy, in Poland. Uh, so they are making their voices heard. Uh, and more and more, uh, it's not just von der Leyen, she's a German uh, centre-right politician. She's hearing criticism from her own party back in Germany and German business. But also she, you hear her talking now about, you know, the need to listen to farmers and the need to kind of give a business case, if you like, for the climate, uh, you know, the, the climate agenda. Uh, so they have definitely made their, their voices heard. Um, so too have businesses. And uh, as we say here, we've got elections, the European Parliament elections take place in June, where the 700 plus members of the European Parliament will be elected. And I think people here in Brussels are worried that the far right uh, could latch onto this issue and uh, really make a dent to some of the centrist parties. Like, for example, uh, some polls are suggesting that Green parties that are represented here in Brussels, that they are going to suffer in these elections. Mm. Uh, it remains to be seen elections now just in a couple of months away, but this whole issue of climate is definitely playing into the, di the dynamic. OK, John, let's broaden this out a little bit, because, of course, a big issue is G20 nations cutting emissions. The other big issue is climate funding for poorer nations who often find themselves on the front lines of climate change. We've got a World Bank, big World Bank meeting this month. Uh, is debt relief and financial aid for these nations going to be on its agenda? I would hope so. I mean, we have to bear in mind that the per capita emissions from uh, the rich countries um, is something like five or six times that from the poorest country. And we have to bear in mind as well that the top 10 percent um, of, of rich countries and rich people in the world, and that includes most of us in Europe, accounts for about 50% of global emissions. So there's an element of culpability here that we can't run away from. Mm. Uh, the drought in Zimbabwe that you mentioned is not the fault of the people of Zimbabwe. It's seriously con contributed to by what we in the West are doing, what we in the developed world are doing. So I think it's incumbent on the G20 to face up to its responsibilities, that it has to be a leader 
are in this area. And the EU and, the, and the Europe in general has been the area that people have looked to for leadership historically in climate. During the years of the Trump administration, for example, it was the EU that kept the candle alive, if you like, and lit in terms of climate action. So I think that we have to look to leaders in the EU and, and wider in the G20. But as, um, as Suzanne was saying, uh, there are countries in the developing world which are, are models in terms of their attention, attentiveness to this issue. And they are willing to forego um, short-term economic growth for long-term sustainability. I think it's time that we also uh, recognise that this is something we have to do in the developed world as well. Mm. Sadly, I think what we have to recognise at the moment is that anybody who thought science informs policy is sadly mistaken. Policy is increasingly obviously formed by short-term lobby groups. And here you have a very unequal uh, division, if you like, of, of, of influence. Very powerful lobby groups groups in Brussels, but very, very weak NGOs and other and other bodies who try and run the counter arguments. And sadly, they are the people who have not been listened to in the mm. past two months. But if we take it right down to the grassroots, Patrick, we've just had a big win, haven't we, for Swiss women at the European Court of Human yes. Rights, ruling that the Swiss government must do more to tackle climate change. I mean, that just shows that grassroots action, everyone taking responsibility, can work. Absolutely. I mean, there's two, there's two levels to that. One is one is the actual ruling, basically saying it is a it is a, a human rights uh, that's 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 being ignored by the Swiss government because the Swiss government's not doing enough. And exactly the same thing can be said uh, across all governments, basically because not enough is being done. If you look at the risk of climate impacts, also we haven't talked much about pollution and toxics, but there's also millions and millions of cases of of reprotoxic uh, impacts of cancer, of early mortality, of early onset dementia, which are associated with a lack of policy action. And I think civil society around the world and citizens around the world are really pushing this information out there. But it requires actually both the people pushing it, but also some people to listen. And fortunately, in this legal case, they, they listened to the evidence and they ruled on the evidence and they concluded that human rights are being breached in this case. And this basically sets an amazing precedent for others. And we also had a, a number of years ago, a law, a law case in, in the Netherlands, which was one, which pushed the Netherlands to do more. So I think the, we have to keep going with this and keep pushing this and putting mm. our arguments up. There are people who listen um, and there are people who fight back and we just need to have more of the people listening than winning. Um, OK. Yeah. And Suzanne, another place where people, the individual is empowered is at the ballot box. And we do have uh, almost half the world going to elections this year. We've got the EU, of course, but many other countries, India, uh, the US, the UK. Are any candidates who are focused on climate likely to win? Well, I mean, we've some, as you say, a, a myriad of, of countries here. I'm thinking of Bangladesh, for example, uh, was also at the polls. It's It has been a country that's been massively affected by climate change. Did it feature in the election? I, I don't think as strongly as, as many people would would think, you know, that the idea is that voters focus on certain issues, on domestic issues, uh, when they go to the polls. In the United States, obviously, this is a hugely, uh, it's become a very political issue. We've seen the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, for example, uh, really take up the cause against electric vehicles, for example, as a kind of divisive uh, wedge issue. Um, now, uh, politicians have to listen to their mainly, you know, younger supporters. Um, you know, polls show that the younger voters uh, do value climate mm. uh, when they policies of, of their uh, politicians. Uh, but they, at the moment, as I say, polls, particularly in Europe for the European elections, are suggesting that those green parties, parties that put climate change at the top, are not going to perform particularly well in these elections here in Europe uh, this summer. John, are we then ultimately going to be leaving this problem for the young people, for the next generation? I think we are. Um, climate is ultimately an intergenerational issue. And um, uh, as Suzanne said, people tend to be preoccupied with short term issues. Who's going to pay the rent? Who's going to pay the mortgage? What's the price of milk going to be in my supermarket? That's why we depend on leadership from our 
elected officials. That's why we depend on people having a longer view and doing the right thing, not just for their own electoral advantage, but for the next generation coming along. And I think, you know, the only hope we have in this area is coming from young people who, who recognise themselves that they are the ones that are going to suffer. They are the ones who are going to have to make the hard choices in an increasingly unsustainable world in the future. And that will be a savage indictment on the current generation, both of people mm. my age and also of our current crop of politicians, that they're not willing to see beyond the short-term political advantages uh, and look to a rather more enlightened future, which could be around the corner. And Patrick, the young generation, also technology. We haven't really touched on that in this discussion, just in the last couple of minutes that we've got. Is that something that perhaps can save us if, when we exceed 1.5 degrees C? I mean, technology is, of course, great and, that, and, and has lots of potential, but we should uh, answer that question. But we also need to make sure we talk about uh, energy efficiency, sufficiency, circular mm. economy, and also even just doing less. I'm not saying put on hair shirts or anything, of course. But with respect to technology, I think this is a really key, key point, because if you look at renewable energies, the prices have gone down massively. If you look at, uh, if, if you just look at the cost curves over time, and yet other people at the same time are pushing forward solutions, which are like carbon capture and storage, nuclear, certain other, 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 other um, investments. Uh, but if if you look at the costs of it, we really need to invest in the whole renewables issue mm. and we really invest in energy efficiency. And then you'll find that we can actually come out. So any people talking about let's let's take the carbon out of the air. I mean, we may need a tiny bit of carbon capture and storage. Okay. But fundamentally, what we need to do is to put all the money in a 100 percent renewables shift. OK, uh, Suzanne, just lastly, you, were, you covered COP28 in Dubai extensively. We've got COP29 in Baku and Azerbaijan coming up next. Are you going? Are you optimistic? What's it going to bring? I will be going. Um, look, there's been a lot of controversy about the fact that Azerbaijan is hosting uh, mm. the next change talks. Uh, it is, has a, a huge fossil fuel industry, uh, as did the UAE, the last host. So there was a lot of concern about that. Um, let's see how it goes. I mean, I think a progress was made at the last uh, COP back in December in Dubai. Uh, but look, preparations are underway here in Brussels, as EU environment ministers are meeting and climate ministers, for example, they're all looking ahead to COP. It's very much uh, the main uh, thing on the agenda in terms of climate this year. Although, as you mentioned, the World Bank IMF meetings this month will also be significant. Mm. Uh, but yes, Going to have a, it, it's going to be the focal point for climate discussions over the next few months. Okay, and a focal two years by the sounds of it. Many thanks to our guests today for joining us, Patrick Tenbrink, John Sweeney and Suzanne Lynch. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here, bye for now. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.